I'm in February. My face. The 18th? 17th. 17th, thank you. And we have a, uh, we don't have a very heavy agenda, I don't think, today. We're going to go through the miscellaneous that bill, uh, first real draft of it. We'll take testimony next week. Uh, we will also be going through uh, a follow up uh, on collective bargaining rights for teachers. Uh, this was, I believe, raised by uh, Senator Gulick. I don't think it's going to take a long time. And then we'll hear from the president of UVM uh, for new senators. We would have had uh, the president in sooner, but of course, he's the president of a major university and has a very busy schedule. Uh, and then we'll have uh, uh, another walkthrough of the school construction bill. And our committee assistant has, you'll see now, added a few bills, uh, has put down the miscellaneous bill as a committee bill and uh, school construction aid, as long as it's okay with you, we'll just do it as a, sure. but if you change your mind, you can always put it in an S1. Yeah, no words. So, Sounds good. miscellaneous education bill, thank you. Thank you, Beskin James, Office of Legislative Council. You have draft 1.1 of the miscellaneous education bill, uh, committee bill in front of you. I will say um, that this is all based on our one conversation yeah. from last week. Yeah. Um, That's why it's so impressive. <laughs> Uh, so I fully expect lots of feedback and changes here. Um, and please don't be shy if I have missed your goals or intent. And if you have additional goals or if there's something in, I am not, for one, married to this. This is just, these are some ideas that we've all talked about and this is the bill that we've generated. So it adds a track. We'll probably move it in uh, middle of March. So the first section is um, State Board of Education Staffing and Compensation Study asking JFO to look at other um, boards and commissions in Vermont, looking at their staffing structures and their compensation structures and uh, making a recommendation about the State Board's staffing and compensation. I tried to um, use some language that um, requires JFO to focus this analysis, right? There's tons of boards and commissions and yeah. they're not, it's, you know, they're not all apples to apples. So I tried to use some of uh, the state board's responsibilities so that they could be looking at boards with similar responsibilities and lifts, if right. you will. Um, so I would encourage you to think about, um, uh, you know, think about that language there, adding, subtracting, changing, et cetera. Um, and just so everyone knows, this goes back to, you know, some of the things we've heard. State board members, at least the chair, I know, and maybe the vice chair is like Tammy Colby. I think that, you know, they're put, sometimes putting in as much as 20 hours a week. Just want to get a sense of, are we compensating them the way we should be or, or not? And if not, is there something we, we should be doing that we should do? Okay. And the second, uh, we're on page two, second section is a report from AOE on statewide course offerings requiring them to look at the difference between offerings within each supervisory union on a union to union basis as well as district to district basis if there are large differences in course offerings between districts within the same SU. Um, that was just kind of a one-off, I think. We want to report on looking at course offerings and throughout the state to see disparities. Um, so I would, in, you know, fully expect that language to develop as yep. we take testimony on yep. that. Through section three on page two, um, a proficiency-based learning study committee. So creating a study committee um, uh, run by AOE um, or staffed by AOE, I should say. Uh, making recommendations for whether proficiency-based learning is the most effective way to ensure Vermont students attain rigorous standards and high-quality programs, whether there are other systems of instruction, assessment grading, and academic reporting that would better serve Vermont students. I would really encourage you to focus yeah. on that okay. mission, yeah. the goals, the responsibilities, as well as the membership of the committee. Mm -hmm. I did the usual Vs in the State Board and yeah. Agency of Education, but you may want to consider subject matter experts that are outside of state government, you know, related to mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah, and if right. everyone over the next few days could just read through this with more detail, generally the V's are on a lot of the committees that we, because they know, they know the principals, they know the superintendent, they know the teachers, <laughs> and uh, we have somebody from the agency, but if it doesn't feel right, if you want other people on, just let me know. And we can't name anybody, of course, but. I mean, you, um, you can, so I've seen things like, um, uh, you know, uh, graduate level professor in whatever, or, um, yeah, I mean, it depends on, I would encourage you to maybe think about, um, the perspective you want to bring to the committee. Okay. And then, um, you, you know, you can brainstorm on who might bring that perspective and then yeah. I can say yay or nay on the rest of the week. Yeah. Um, and then page five, a remote teacher grant program. I will say, again, that was like a one-off. Yeah. Let's do a grant program on this. Um, and I don't know how, you know, we, we'll think about this and read through it. You know, yesterday's testimony made me feel really good that there are a lot of kids seem to be able to access, you know, these classes. My concern was that a lot of kids from pre and reduced lunch families aren't accessing. So we're talking about the, the course offerings that are already that are already, available with, yeah, uh, yeah. Virtually. Yeah, virtually. So I would encourage you to take testimony on the um, collaborations that are already existing if you haven't already. I played around on the agency's website last night. And okay. there, there are a lot of, um, oh gosh, I'm, I'm going to get it wrong. It's like the Vermont Learning Collaborative. It's the provide they've provided the structure for the virtual um, attendance yeah. uh, piece through COVID, but it was there before COVID, and it exists now, and it has all kinds of partnership structures for public schools. Right. Um, so, so some of it may be already. Some of it, I would really encourage you to <clears throat> yep. take some. It's we can hear from them. It's different than just having a teacher in Bennington sitting at home and teaching in one class, teaching advanced calc in yeah. Burlington. It, this, the system that is already in place is different than that, but um, you may hear about ways to loop it all into the existing structure. Um, page six, section five, post-secondary school marketing. Again, this is another kind of, yeah. I don't really have more information, but, um, a yet to be determined sum appropriated from the general funds, the Agency of Tourism and Marketing for the purpose of marketing Vermont for sector. Yeah, and my takeaway yesterday was this, yeah, we'll talk to Senator Ron Hinsdale and Senator Kitchell, and maybe it's more about just beefing up their marketing dollars in general, but uh, glad it's still there and we'll dig into it. Um, section six is just the pre-kindergarten education statute as it stands now. Because, um, and this is uh, to address the issue, I think you heard that um, currently the Act 166 subsidy for pre-K is not being able to be used across the border in New Hampshire or right. New York, um, where there is potentially a need for that. Um, so I have not proposed any amendments to this section. What I have done is gone through and highlighted in the statute itself there's, there's nothing in the statute that says the money can't go to out of state. Oh. It comes within the qualifications of the programs. Okay. Um, so is it possible that the program that we heard just didn't qualify? No. So okay. I think so. I, um, uh, the agency has given testimony on this topic in a different committee. Okay. Um, and from my just my so I would encourage you to perhaps hear the same testimony. Um, I'm guessing it was house ed or was it? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, and the testimony was not very long. Um, and But also for my just plain reading of this, there's nothing in here that says you can't go to a, a school outside of the state. But there's language in here about um, the, the program having to be based on Vermont's early learning standards. Okay. There's a requirement that there be a licensed teacher by a, a Vermont licensed teacher. It doesn't just say a licensed teacher, it's specific to Vermont's licensing law. And then the, the rules that were promulgated to administer the program are even more specific when it comes to private programs and being licensed by DCF. 
I don't know anything about DCF licensing. I don't know if there are uh, uh, interstate agreements regarding child care and child care subsidies and all that jazz. Um, so when it comes to Act 166 funding being able to be used outside of the state, mm -hmm. um, my encouragement would be to really hear from the field on how those pre-qualified private providers are being approved and the specific criteria that are being used. Um, Do you remember who they heard from? In Emily House? Simmons. Emily Simmons, thank you. <clears throat> um, and committee, you may remember, this is a constituent of Senator Kitchell's. They've got an early childhood program that's really far away. Isn't that it? And they just want to go to the Board of New Hampshire that's super close. I think that's the that's my basic understanding yeah, yeah. of the problem. And you're saying that it's possible that that could happen right now, but well, I think, it might not meet certain standards. Well, it's, it's, I'm not saying it's possible. I'm saying the law doesn't say you can't go to New Hampshire. You can't okay. use this out of state. Yeah. The program requirements themselves may be the limiting factor. Uh, okay. And I think hearing on how those program requirements are interpreted would be really helpful Great. to you in deciding whether or not you want to make any changes to that. Great. So Emily Simmons, Hayden, you just mark her name down and we'll have her in uh, to look at this section. So okay. that is just the pre-K yep. law. You can, a lot of pages that you can yep. We're going to go to, we're going to go to page 17, section seven. There was a question about whether you could um, include libraries in the definition of school or um, include them, make them be school zones, I think is the term you used for uh, regulation of firearms purposes. Yep. Yep. Um, so I've just made a suggestion here. So the first thing I will say is this, there's in Title 16, there's a prohibition on students having firearms in schools. And then the, the, the firearm exclusion from schools and school buildings is a criminal statute. It's not in Title 16 for, 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 for other, other than students. There's requirements about guns in state buildings. I believe a lot of libraries, not all, so if they're in a school, they're already covered by a school. <laughs> Um, but most of them are going to be municipally managed, owned, associated. So you could certainly look at creating a new prohibition, um, either in criminal law and tying it to libraries. Um, and if that's the route you want to go, I would loop in my call, one of my colleagues who does the who does Title Thirteen, the uh, criminal uh, title. There, in lieu of and and if you want to do something about um, municipal buildings, I would loop in my other colleague who handles municipal law, and, and um, libraries are in Title Twenty Two. There is, however, a working group on the status of libraries. Mm -hmm. um, Currently working. Yep, we put that in statute yep. a couple years ago. Yep. yep. <clears throat> Their report is not due until November. Mm -hmm. So a suggestion I have is you'll see on page 18, adding to their charge, but looking at whether current law provides adequate protections for libraries from firearm violence, and then requiring their report to include legislative recommendations. Um, regarding firearm and weapon safety on library property. That language might need to be workshopped a little bit. Um, but that's one avenue um, if you don't want to um, just outright make that change now. I don't know jurisdictionally if you're looking at amending criminal law. Yeah. I don't know if that would be this committee. Yeah. I'm just looking at Senator yeah. Hashim. He's, yeah. he's interested in this. this yeah. So no, what are you thinking? Yeah. yeah no, you, you can, it's your turn to put me on the spot. So. Um, no, it's, uh, I mean, the genesis of this. You know, the largest library in Brattleboro, the second floor is almost entirely filled with the uh, kids section. Um, a few librarians have asked, you know, can we make libraries equivalent to schools so that we can more easily prohibit people coming in with firearms because they've had, and drugs, um, you know, because they've had situations where they have a crowd of kids in this 
large classroom and then somebody walking around with a rifle or a pistol and it's it's a little frightening um, so that was the request from the librarians um, but I could also see how this might end up being a judiciary <clears throat> miscellaneous bill this language we could probably yeah. do okay with if yeah. you wanted to just you know one separate constituents say yeah. hey this is one avenue that on your afternoon committee you could move forward with while also talking to your judiciary yeah it's just something to think about yeah yeah, yeah. Well, that makes sense thank you sir can i, can I interview you um yes. why not just um say all municipal buildings well, well i mean i could but that wasn't the uh, request for my constituent. Um, I mean, this is a pretty specific thing coming from the librarians in Brattleboro and, you know, exploring banning firearms in all municipal buildings is, def is something that I imagine would be talked about in judiciary. Um, we wanted to go that route. And then yeah. there's also the Don't get me wrong, I love doing work that's supposed to happen in other committees <laughs> just to keep colleagues on their toes. Yeah. But yeah, this, this I think we could yeah, 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 but, definitely. Yeah. But I just, I mean, obviously, I want to keep children in libraries safe, but uh, there are children and families in other municipal buildings as well, and mm -hmm. other vulnerable people, and uh, just, I don't know, just putting yeah. them out there. Sarah, so, so, like, select board hat. Yeah, select board hat, yeah. You know, yeah. I think the municipality can just make that a rule. They can put a sign up, and then no, no firearms prohibited. Yeah. Fire, firearms are prohibited. In every municipal bill. Yeah, they can do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Did ask me We've to done do that. that. So, yeah. 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 Oh yeah. I mean, we tried to do it. I think as the select board, just outside of the, some buildings, and but that could be because they were just outside the buildings and it needed some legislative action. But okay, yeah, that's good to know. Yeah. So we'll keep it in. Touch yeah. base. Yeah. Who knows? That's yeah. Seems good. good. Okay. And that's it. Okay. Thank you. So I would say, you know, miscellaneous education bills, all sorts of things end up in them. We'll pass this out in a couple of weeks. So we've got time. We're going to hear from uh, people next week. But if you have time to read it over over the next few days, nothing sells, in my opinion, nothing says happy birthday more than an evening of <laughs> homework. It's Senator yeah. Cook's birthday ah. than reading the miscellaneous education bill. Um, and reading it as a family is even more fun. <laughs> well, I cannot stress enough that. I understand. This is, there's been very little clear direction on a lot of this, yeah. so I would anticipate you getting a lot of feedback about language changes. Totally, totally. Um, so to the extent you want me in the room to hear some of that testimony, um, if it works for my schedule, yeah. uh, it, it might be more efficient to have me here, and I'm happy to do that. Yeah, and yeah, you can let you know. We have some people, you know, tentatively lined up for sure. next week. So, okay. anything yeah. else? Beth, thanks a million. You're welcome. That was Thank really you. great. Happy birthday. Thank you. Appreciate it. Can I ask a few questions yeah. of the um, committee? Yeah. Since we're, we have a still in front Should of we us. have a uh, best day? No, I don't think sure. so. Okay. I don't have anywhere to go. I mean, you can if you want. Um, sure. <laughs> um, I, my, a couple of questions that I had um, were, we had discussed a few times personal finance and then civics, and I was wondering if that's something that we might want to think about again, just think about right, putting yeah. And then my other question was just about the statewide course offerings in grade kindergarten through 12. What I was just wondering generally, and this is not a question just for you, Chair, but the whole all of us on this committee, what, what's our goal in doing this? What are we trying to achieve? Do we want to um, I know we talked a little bit about equity. We want, like we want to see if there's equity from one district to another, but that was really, at least in my thinking, that's what I was just trying to kind of figure out: is are there areas that we need to focus on and fill holes? You know, if and I was thinking honestly more nine through twelve, but you know, if they're going to look at something, it kind of goes back to what I was thinking with getting these technical more technology in schools if mm -hmm. they don't have something. And again, we all sort of bring our own personal experience, I don't really know, but I know in some rural schools, just because of teacher shortages, right. they don't have certain offerings that you might find in bigger schools where there are more people to live and maybe more housing options. So just trying to understand what, if there's an equity issue around that. And I think for future 
committees, I would say it might be helpful just to have a sense of that landscape out there. Well, I was wondering, I was thinking about is should we take a look at, for example, like um, EQS and standards? Because it seems as though courses sort of are born, you know, of those, of, you know, you can have a variety of courses, but they're all going to be based or have their genesis somewhere in like in the standards yeah. or EQS or so I was just wondering if yeah. you should just take a deep dive on those before or maybe before doing this. I mean, sort of make sure all schools are meeting those or working toward them. Yeah, or maybe just for our own, just to have a knowledge of, for me, it would be helpful to have a knowledge of those before looking at the courses, because the courses are almost like secondary to the structure, you know what I mean? Does that make sense? Yeah, it, do, it totally does. The only other thing I'm just going back to is, and again, it was one story, the UVM kid. Yeah. Gets his letter, thanks but no thanks. You need three years of math, you only up, you only took two. Now Tom Sullivan again intervened right. and said, No, you can come to UVM. But just to just to make sure that we're kind of okay out there is what I'm just trying to get a sense of. And there might be another way to do it. Yeah. I am wondering if that student had the option of online courses or um, uh, dual oh. enrollment. My gut is no without mine. Okay. That's my gut, only yeah. because it was, I mean, I guess there were online courses like 12 years ago, but I don't know if it was in that. I don't know if that was in And in terms of dual enrollment, mm -hmm. Mr. Fannin, when was dual enrollment, like, would you guess, 15 years ago? Oh, no. No. Well, no. Well, 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 uh, yeah. So 12, 12, 15. Um, okay. It's not that long. Not that long. Okay. 2012. 2012. Okay. Really? That's it. It's not. Oh wow. Okay. Oh, okay. It's not ancient. Yeah. It's yeah. Current. Yeah. And it's yeah. current iteration. Yeah. Right. Sam Williams, do you have a question? Just one question for Beth. We we keep talking about equity and, and we're talking about equity issues. Yeah. Does, does Act sixty of nineteen ninety seven still apply? So that was about funding, right? Right. Um so uh at, uh when you say does Act 60 still apply, what do you mean? Well, the reason it was it was the education Brigham. Act, Brigham. And education bill. Brigham. So the right. Brigham decision, Correct. which requires substantially equal educational opportunities for all Vermonters, yes. That is your North Star still. Substantially equal, I think, is perhaps what you are trying to understand with this um, report. Uh, what does that look like today? Right. Substantially equal, but yes, the, the requirement for substantially equal educational opportunities is, is still still so good. So my line. question is: Are we still are we layering requirements on top of that original uh, decision, the Brigham decision, as we go through our process and keep adding requirements to it? I mean, it's it's a basic concept. Mm -hmm. I mean, are we layering on requirements uh, from the state right. onto local districts that, uh, yeah, maybe you and I and Beth can sit down and sort of Just think about some of that stuff. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. Sure. On the personal finance and civics, mm -hmm. I am all for, if anybody wants to bring some language for it, there is some language you might want to check in the house. Mm -hmm. I think a bill was put in. And if it makes sense, uh, let us know. Okay. And the civics, are we getting a report back to you from the Agency of Education and Civics? No. Holocaust education? Oh, only. just Holocaust education? It was always. So we can talk about, we can have another conversation. We could put it on the agenda, just civic education and personal finance. If there's something from those that we want to put in there, or if we want to do a standalone. If there's thought, information we have. I thought a few senators were working on a bill around civics education. That's why I'm surprised yeah. it hasn't come around yet. Yeah. The one bill that comes up every year, I don't know if it's going to be the same one, is the one that says in order to graduate from high school, you have to pass an exam on civic ed. Huh? We've generally said the state doesn't do curriculum, but we do standards. Civic ed is in the standards, but Listen, 
always happy to entertain anything that anybody has. Usually, Mark or uh, Dick McCormick. That's what, that's what yeah, you know. yeah. So he's been putting it in since the early 1960s and um, sooner. Uh, it, he has put it in every year, and some stuff's come out of it, but. Because because it's in the standards and social studies teachers do cover it in different ways. And one thing that could be really interesting, <coughs> the guy at Harwood does an amazing job of civics, wow. you know, and what he does. And I know I think the agency has a website for civics, you know, ideas. So we, we can keep talking yeah. about it. Yeah. Okay. And the Secretary of State is doing it. And the Secretary of State is yeah. doing it. You yeah. got very close last year to requiring actually changing EQS standards on like civics. Yes. And then we pulled it back to just the Holocaust report. Okay. So you, you, you did got, have a discussion okay. about that. Last year's committee is yep. out of control, though. This is a much more. Um, okay. Thanks a million, Beth. Have a great weekend. Thank you as well. Mr. Leonard, it's just, it's just a touching base, see how everything's going in Ed, or do you want to say a few words about something? <laughs> Come on up. Okay. We haven't seen you since uh, orientation. Yeah. Well, Nice to see everyone. It's my first time in the committee this year, so always an exciting moment for me. Of course, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> uh, we're talking about collective bargaining, and yep. just to uh, reframe it, do you remember the actual question that was asked? Do you remember it? So, and I'm looking to Mr. Robinson, because you sent us a great email. And I said, nice email, but it was raised in committee, so let's just oh, pull this no. apart a little bit. Do you want to, Mr. Robinson, just introduce Before, yourself? Uh, Colin Robinson, Vermont NEA. It was a question about board certified behavior analysts yeah. yes. and okay. their inclusion in teacher collective bargaining units or not. Okay. I believe was sort of the mm -hmm. nuts of the inquiry. And Mr. Leonard, just so you know, the president of UVM will be here at two. Okay, yeah. I'll be very quick. Great, thank you. So uh, collective bargaining at the schools, there are two laws that apply, Labor Relations for Teachers and Administrators Act, and then the, the Municipal Labor Relations Act. Basically, you fall under Labor Relations for Teachers uh, if you have to be, the wording in the statute is licensed employable as a teacher by the Vermont Standards Board for Professional Educators and not an administrator. So administrators, principals, vice principals, they fall under their own group. Um, what that's been determined uh, by the Labor Board to include is anyone who needs to get an endorsement from the, the um, Standards Board for Professional Educators. This is your school nurse. They may have their professional license, but then to be in the school, they need that endorsement. If you need that, you fall under labor relations for teachers. If you do not need an endorsement or a certification or license to be uh, working in the school, so for example, custodial staff, uh, front office staff, um, maintenance staff, uh, any number of other folks I'm sure I'm forgetting now, but if you don't need that license or endorsement, you fall under the Municipal Labor Relations Act. Uh, so typically the Labor Board tries to uh, include, make the bargaining units as large as possible for simplicity. Um, so you might see custodians and front office staff and bus drivers in the same union, even though they have different jobs. Um, but that's just for administrative ease in negotiating contracts, you're doing one negotiation instead of three or four or five. The issue here is, uh, and I, I don't know uh, about a great deal about the board certified behavior analysts, but in order to be covered under labor relations for teachers, they need to require an endorsement. In order to be covered under municipal labor relations, they don't. In both instances, though, their employer needs to be the, the school district or supervisory union. Uh, if they're employed by an outside third party and then they come in on a contract basis, that's a completely different labor relations right. ball field. Yeah. So, like how our mental health or exactly. Yep. Okay. So if, if they're contracted, 
Um, but if they're employed directly by the school district, it's really a question of whether they're, they're in, they need an endorsement or licensure to teach in the school, or, or if they don't, they're under the municipal act. Yeah. Um, so that is all I've got as sort of the overview. Are there any questions? No, that seems pretty cut and dry. I was asked by a constituent who is in a school who um, just, you know, it's been um, different times because of our shortage, staffing shortage. And I think there are folks who've been sort of tapped to do duties outside of what they would normally be doing. So she was just asking, you know, boy, it's too bad these folks aren't in the same family as the teachers, so to speak, in terms of contracts. but. I totally understand that. That's yeah. Great. So the standard yeah, board. She she's full time. She's full time. She's full time. Yeah. yeah. If the standards board requires endorsement for them at some point in the future, they could potentially come into the teachers union. Um, the otherwise they'll they'll likely be in the the non licensed union. Um, there is always the potential that the labor board could determine that a particular group should be in a different bargaining unit because there's such a difference in the interests. Right. Yeah. But their history has been typically to try to bring the groups together. Because yeah. what happens in Vermont towns is you'll have one unit of three people, one unit of two, right. if, you, if you start splitting people out because we're just too small. Yeah. So. Okay, thank you. Great. Anything else, Mr. Chair? No, I do you want to say anything, Mr. Robinson, about it? Yeah, uh, briefly. Yeah, yeah, please, come uh, on up. Thanks. Yep. Um, thanks, Mr. Leonard. So for the record, Colin Robinson, Vermont NDA, um, everything Damien said. Um, and in addition, I just want to say that the Vermont Standards for, for Professional Educators does create new endorsement categories for licensure. You know, I'm going, I don't know for sure, but I'm going to assume when licensure first started in the state of Vermont, we didn't have a social work endorsement, right? right, Or a school nurse endorsement, which there is now for teaching. Okay. Um, and so we, I will say as a general matter, we have, to Senator Gula's point, we have noticed over the past couple of years, there are some professional positions in schools that currently don't have a teacher licensure endorsement that we've been thinking it might be worth having a conversation with the Vermont Standards Board about exploring and they you know they're a um, uh, they have a whole rulemaking process that they would go through to do that um, and so anyways we've actually been thinking are there some additional positions that have emerged in recent years that it might be worth exploring, uh, the, having a conversation with the standards board about building out some additional licensures that then would allow these individuals. I will say to the other side of the coin, um, and actually I think this was in the Burlington School District recently, there were some um, occupational therapists and physical therapists that approached us about forming a union and um, did and are now part of the support staff bargaining unit in Burlington okay. because they are not, there's not a OT or PT license, teacher licensure. So to um, so Damien's point, which one? Which one? the municipal bargaining unit okay. for the support staff because they don't have a yeah. teaching license. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but. For teacher licensure, there's school psychiatrists, nurses. Um, I think in the email that I shared with um, Sarah Campion and Sarah Gulick, I had a page from the rules for the standards board that enumerated all the various categories that um, teacher licensure exists in right now. So, so if yeah. if Senator Gulick or a committee member or anybody wanted to just have that looked at, I mean, it sounds like you're looking at it regularly. But does it make, you'll let us know if it makes sense for us to, I mean, even in Ms. Lane said, say, gosh, would you review the possibility of, you know, this kind of thing for this kind of profession? Yeah, and I think it might be um, worth inquiring of the, the standards for too. You mm -hmm. know, you could, you know, I think if you wanted to sort of noodle that over a little more as a committee about what are kind of the evolution of 
public education and the professionals working in our schools with students and have licensure. Yeah. The standards board, I believe the current chair of that, actually Don Tinney, our president, was the previous chair prior to his service as president of ours. The current chair, I believe, is the superintendent um, in the Colchester School District. Maybe Yeah. Um, so, but they are, you know, they go through the LCAR process, you know, whenever they are making any adjustments to rules and impacting licensure. So, okay. cool. we can talk about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Great. Pretty see you. Good to see you too. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Thanks. So we're just waiting for President Garamella. And let me just take a look at the score. Five minutes. Welcome back to Senate Education. We have with us uh, President Garamella from the University of uh, Vermont and Wendy Koenig, uh, the federal and state relations and legislative liaison for the University of Vermont. Mr. President, this is the first time you've been in here officially to provide us with an update, provide us with some information on the university. So we're very excited that you're here. And we know that we elected one new trustee one returning trustee uh, in Senator Tolino, and then in Senator and Shep Smith also. So, so uh, yeah, returning new and an old returning. So, yes, yeah. It's all of that. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, thank you. I've been to this committee, of course, many times before um, this room, and I love coming. Um, but, but lots of new faces in the Senate and the House, of course, and so more than happy to uh, you know answer questions and really help you understand that we're a partner uh, for the state and we take our partnership very seriously. Uh, what, what we should do for the state, what we can do for the state, etc. And so we have this one pager. Uh, we've got some copies of a, or we have a hard copy would be helpful. Okay, great. So I just wanted to give you a quick sense for anyone who's, uh, I know you're enamored of and brought it, you brought you to Vermont, but um, just a, 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 a few details, and then I'm happy to answer questions and such. So um, we, we tried these one pagers because it's, it, it concentrates information, and so just wanted to give you a sense that there are 3,700 plus students from Vermont at, at UVM, um, and I'm very proud that about a quarter of them are pet eligible, which of course, as you know, means they're from the lower income uh, end of the spectrum and about a quarter are first gen students. I think this first generation um, of students generally needs, you know, they, they, they need more um, orientation to what uh, higher education is and such. They may not have families that are supporting them the same way. So we've been leaning into that a lot. And many of us in the administration are first generation. So we have been recording our stories and telling them That's great. What, what, you know, our pathway has been. And um, um, so they feel supported and not, not alone. So that's going well. And, um, you know, we had over a thousand Vermonters on uh, degrees at UVM this past year. So, you know, big for Vermont standards, we produce a lot of uh, graduates. The little green box on the side is one that I'm particularly um, proud of. I mean, certainly we, we not only educate students, but they get jobs and, um, and, and uh, lead productive lives, 96, 95% of them um, are employed right after graduation. But the next number, which is that we had 1,155 of our graduates live and work in Vermont after graduating. I think that's a huge deal. There's no other entity, no other force in Vermont that brings that many students and that many highly talented people to, uh, to the state. So, and of course, because we have a good out-of-state population, this means that six or 700 students from outside of the state are studying at UVM and working here. The thing we could do as all together as a state is to maybe make the state stickier for these people. How do we ensure that they stay longer and not just get their first job and, and move on? But, but that I think the fact that we are the most significant attractor of talent to the state is, is of great importance to me. Um, the little by part, Mr. President, you mean in terms of our, your other competitors in the state, or are you talking about as a, also as a business and a company? Well, there's no other entity in the state that brings in over a thousand people into the state, highly qualified. Um, nobody else. Uh, there's no IBM there. Yeah. And Global yeah. Foundries doesn't. And, and so, yeah, it is the single largest yeah. entity that, I mean, I, 
Yeah, no, I hadn't thought about it that way. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, we, we, we don't have great livers to attract lots of people. I mean, we can give them yeah. a little money to come, et cetera, but it's not that big uh, an attractor. So, And I think the piece below is something which, um, you know, is a great personal relevance to me, personal importance to me. It's my passion. We've, if you've heard anything about UVM, I hope you've heard that we've frozen tuition now for five years in a row. Yeah. We have um, uh, frozen room and board. We've frozen fees. So we don't, you know, freeze one thing and increase it somewhere else. There's no gimmicks here. And that's been very difficult to do. It's not easy to say, well, we'll stay flat. And while our expenses go up, our expenses go up about $10 million a year. So we're foregoing a lot of um, revenue by not increasing it. But, but affordability and access and being as expensive as we are as a public um, state, uh, you know, land, uh, land grant, but also a flagship was very important. So for a fifth year, we've been able to do that. Um, I'll say that, the, that this past fifth year of the freeze had very much to do with the, the increase in our appropriation that you were able to uh, approve. So we're very thankful to the legislature. Um, we're very thankful to the uh, um, governor for putting it in his budget last year. And before that, we had had no change in our base budget for 14 years. And you know, if you calculate it, basically 14 years of no increase means about a 25% drop. So we had a 25% issue increase last year. So we're back to where we were in 2008. Um, and that's been very effective for us, very good for us. I mean, it's a small amount based on our budget, but it helps us do these kinds of things. Um, the bullet below that is especially exciting because this year, this semester, we announced um, the UVM Promise. And that is basically that any Vermont family making $60,000 or less can send their children to UVM paying no tuition and no fees as long as they qualify. So I think this is extremely, it's very, extremely important that we make it as simple and as clear as possible because I think that there are students in eighth grade and sixth grade and such who think, well, what's the point of working so hard? I couldn't afford UVM anyway. Mm -hmm. So here we're telling them that, hey, work hard, get good grades, and you can go to UVM, not paying anything, right? at least in terms of tuition and fees. And so so they, they're basically responsible for room and board. Right, right. So and I'm hoping that this funding. message gets through to counselors, to everyone. I was, mm -hmm. I was in DC yesterday. I was talking to Senator Sanders. He was just really excited. And first time I saw him that happy um, with me. But um, sorry, <laughs> she told me after being a little irreverent. But he said he'll put, he'll talk about it in the Bernie Buzz. Um, so I, I really do think we need to get the word out because the more our parents, our students understand that there is a pathway to Vermont, to the University of Vermont, if they work hard, um, you know maybe that will that'll help the numbers we have a little bit. As you all know, we have among the highest rates of high school graduation in the country and among the lowest yeah. rates of going on to college. On the other hand, despite the highest rates of high school graduation, we don't have that many numbers of students, right? So and the number that worries me a lot is I had checked and we had 7,200 high school graduates in Vermont in 2010. And in 2020, that number dropped to 55. 7,200 to 5,500 is a very serious drop. And that continues. There's not that many students being produced in, uh, or high school graduates being produced in New England. And so what that, that was part of the reason that drove our push for getting students in Vermont that are from beyond New England. And so for this fall, we had 30,000 plus applications. So 30,000 applications for 3,000 seats is pretty good. It's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? And that allowed us That's to, just undergraduates. That's undergraduates, yeah. So that allowed us to construct a class that we're very proud of, which has the largest number of first generation students we've ever had, the largest number of students of color we've ever had, and over 50% of them are from outside of New England, you know, California and Texas and Hawaii and all this sort of stuff. And I think that means long term, we're recognized more broadly, we continue to uh, have interest in UVM. So the UVM promise, I would ask you all to spread the word as much as you can. 
Um, I can turn to the other side briefly. I don't need to go off. If you don't mind, while we're just on that. So how does that compare with your competitors? I know some institutions are saying 150,000 or less. You know, others are saying even maybe a little higher. How, where does that, you know, compare to who you're competing right. with? I don't know if another institution in the country <laughs> that has done this voluntarily from their own resources. Okay. Everyone else who does this, I, I could be wrong by, and there might be one example, but I don't think so. The state has provided money to universities, to public universities, to, to do something like this. Okay. We're doing this on our own, and the reason we picked 60,000 is that it covers about half the households in Vermont. And it seems like a good number to go with. The uh, median income in Vermont, as you know, is about 63,000, 63,100 and something. Didn't seem like a right, nice um, number to ring. That, that, that doesn't ring well. So that's why we picked it. And I thought there were a bunch already, vast, or you know, a bunch of just institutions out there that were kind of doing this. Senator Hashim, you might know something. Uh, I actually had a different question. OK, please. please. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So those are private schools, too? So yeah, no, I understand. So, I'm, so yes, so you do compete with some private schools. Yeah, sure, you do. Sure, okay. Of course, yeah. But okay. I mean, in Vermont, though, this is yep. for Vermonters. Yeah, the Zuvian Prom is for Vermonters. Yeah. So I see. I think yep. it's very much targeted to try and increase that number yep. of students who are going on to college. Yep. Sorry. Oh no. Course. Yeah. Senator Chief. Um, yeah. So I was just looking at the number on the first page. Um, yeah. Nine out of ten Vermont first year students return for their sophomore year, which seems like a great number. I'm just wondering that small fraction of folks who do decide to transfer or just not return. I was wondering if what reasons they might say. Yeah, no, it's a great question. You're, and, and I think like this too, I think 90% is great, but that means 10% are being left behind, right? I will say that there's no way you can ever have 100% because people make the wrong choice sometimes. They go to college and think it's not for me. UVM is among the top 5% in the country, give or take, I haven't checked this year, but in terms of um, retention rates among publics. Okay, so very good at retention. We're doubling down on retention. We're going up by a percent or two. The provost has goals for us. So I feel like it's our moral responsibility once we take students on to actually see them through college and have them graduate and be productive citizens of uh, the, the state and country. So um, there are students who, um, who, who may come from Seattle or so and say, I thought Vermont would be fun. And, it's not for me, or it's too cold, or, or the, I don't agree with the politics of the place, or whatever else. There are others who find it more rigorous than they would have, than they can handle. Um, so there are multiple reasons. It, uh, this is a number that almost can never be much higher than nine, unfortunately. Um, we are trying to do our best. Some of the things we're trying to do is that we have a very effective partnership with um, CCB. Um, where we have almost every program CCB offers is a two, there's a partnership pathway to UVM. So go to CCB, you know, take courses, do well, and you're guaranteed admission at UVM. It's it's even less expensive for them that way. Three um, kind of thing requirement. Yeah, it's yeah. not even three point oh. That's great. It's, it's somewhere that's it's great. Great. maybe less than three point oh. I think. Yeah. So um, and those students who come to us from CCB graduate at higher rates, do better and are retained better. So it actually is a good pathway for them. So sometimes they may go there and, and, and do a different pathway. But yeah. um, so, and some drop off, some take a gap year, that comes from that number, et cetera, et cetera. So we keep looking at that very carefully. We do exit interviews with who's leading and all those things. But it's a good question, but that's not an easy, we might get to 9.12 two maybe, but not, it may not be able to get much higher than that. That makes sense, thank you. And if some may not be able to afford it. Actually, that has a lot to do with it. Their family situation changed, and you'll be able to expense it, et etc. Et and we help when those hard things happen, but we can only help so much. So, sorry. That's okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> question about new American students in particular. We um, at um, Burlington High School had a student graduate who was the first kid to graduate from high school in his family. It was a big deal. Wonderful, wonderful kid. Um, ended up going to a college out of state um, with a scholarship to play soccer. And um, 
things spiraled out of control. I think it's really hard for a first-gen student to be placed on a college campus with, let's face, a lot of wealth. Yeah. A lot, there's a yeah. lot of wealth. There's a lot yeah. of um, cultural pieces that are um, strange, yes. frankly. Um, so he ended up engaging in some behavior that wasn't tolerated by the school, got kicked off the soccer team. His life basically kind of spiraled after that. And he ended up getting kicked out. And um, long story short, he's no longer with us. He, um, yeah, it was, Sorry. he mm. came back to Burlington and it was just a tragedy. Um, so that's an extreme story, I know, but I am one of supports you put in place that need to be pretty, um, you know, thorough. Yeah. And yeah, can you speak to that at all? Well, I mean, I'm really, you know, it's, it's heartbreaking when you hear these stories, but you know, there is, I'm sure you've heard of this. There's a, there's a term called the hidden curriculum. Now, I like the term because, um, so the hidden curriculum is what students don't know when they come from backgrounds that are not, so they don't know how to apply for internships, they may not know how to get jobs, how to network and all that sort of stuff. So we've been focusing on that quite a bit. The Honors College certainly puts a lot of wraparound services around students for that. So. I think that UVM is actually quite good at that aspect, right? We are considered a kind and caring place. Everyone is. I mean, I'm not saying there's not the odd hazing or whatever else, but we have identity centers. If these are students of color, for example, our identity centers are all over this. There's a, there's a mosaic center for you know persons of color, but primarily black students. There's a, a prison center for LGBTQ plus students, etc. There's a women and, and uh, you know, gender equity center, etc. So, and then there's the Newman Center for Catholic students and Hillel for, you know, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So, I think we actually have a very well functioning set of identity centers and student support centers. Our student um, services, uh, student affairs group is very clued into this thing. Um, there are, what is it called, a report, a care report, I think. Anyone can file a care report. If I see someone struggling or they're lashing out or something, you can file an anonymous care report saying, hey, it looks like X is, um, may need some help. So it's just, um, it's a someone idea. goes, reaches up, right? And we, I, mean, I have done that, others have done that. Yeah, I've done that. So, um, so there's a long list, but we really care about doing the best we can. I do think this new Americans thing, um, we could do more in that space. Uh, Senator, uh, I mean, sorry, uh, Representative Carol Odie, who's mm -hmm. on our, as a trustee, she has been talking from the beginning, from my time here, about Minuski High School has a lot of new Americans. You know, Burlington High School has a lot of new Americans. What are we doing? You know, we could go to the Bronx and bring students, et cetera, but we've got our own in our backyard. And so we've got a new uh, permanent dean for the College of Education and Social Services. Katie Shepard, she's amazing. She might have been in here. Oh, she was good. Zoom. Yeah, she great. was very, she was great. Katie, yeah, yeah. She was great. Yeah. So um, she's developing approaches to doing more of this because you got to, the social work piece is important too, the mental health piece is important, the finances piece is important. So, um, you know, we could always do better and we continue to seek to do better, but I think, um, I hope that this student would have had a better uh, experience. We've got caps counselors. Um, yeah. We've got outdoor clubs and or clubs that are pretty, I think, um, welcoming. Yeah. Um, so I think I I know I really felt that moment that this student needed to be brought in. Yes. Um, and it was literally a matter of life and death. And yeah. um, so athletics actually. And now yeah. that you mentioned he was in soccer or mm -hmm. his student was in soccer, um, our athletics program is a very strong culture of. You know, spread respect and DEI. They've got their own group, and I would say they actually lean in more than the rest and support each other. So, you know, it would be stupid for me to say if he were at UVM, he wouldn't have had the same experience. I don't know, but um, we hope that we do as much as we can. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I know we may have asked this of you when you stopped by that one afternoon and caught some of us in committee, but all of the students that aren't getting into UVM. Does the Dean of Admissions ever say, you know, if you want to be in Vermont, state colleges, give them a shot. You know, 
know, it, it, does that kind of conversation ever happen? Could that conversation happen? You, you know, I mean, again, I know it's not going to be for everybody, uh, but, you know, and, I'm, and it may very well be on everybody, you know, students' radar, but the, the chair of agriculture where I spend the mornings, you know, when we're looking at these numbers, it was, you know, is there any way to be helpful in that regard? Right. You know, I, in my previous institution, we had regional campuses, uh -huh. and we, we went through a process wasn't happening before. He said, "If you don't get in here, you'll automatically be considered at that." No, you know, not everybody would pick it up. Yeah. But, um, so I think the CCB pathway itself is something mm -hmm. that I believe is a very important piece of this cog. We did uh, uh, cog in this wheel. Um, we started a program this year called Karma Experience, mm -hmm. where students who don't quite make it um, but are close and seem promising, we actually admit them in a cohort. We give them wraparound services and uh, they all stay together and um, take classes. And if they do 2.8, I want to say, or something like that, they're automatically in. So that's going really well. Um, so well that these students don't want to move out of there into the dorms. They want to stay together as a cohort. And I think almost all of them will qualify, or most of them will, will qualify to move in. So that's another way to get that next rung. Um, but to the very specific thing, I think it also depends on whether these out-of-state students or in-state students. I doubt very much that out-of-state students would be interested in a program like that. I suspect in-state students work with VSAC and such, and VSAC is so effective, they probably know that already. Yeah. Um, so we can keep looking at that. No, I, I appreciate that. My second question, back to the first-generation college students. Yeah. Do you, have, do they have some services yeah. that, oh great, Great. So, because I can see where those numbers, maybe you would lose some of them more often. Yeah. But you have it sounds like well, services on them as well. Yeah. Really. So. So they self-identify during the process yeah. and can. We're celebrating them. Right. Like the board meeting, I think we had a cool slide up. We've got you know Patty Prelock has done a little video that I yeah. first gen. We've all got cords now that are first gen cords for all of us that are first gen. Um, People record their videos. Our, our um, general counsel happens to be a, a person, person, and he said, I want to record a video. And so I think it's a lot of encouragement, but a lot of support services too. So I think we have a first gen office, I want to say, mm -hmm. or certainly a, a, that looks out for them. Again, we could do more, but I think we need to keep it. So great, thank you. Um, to turn around, I got just a couple more quick things to share. You know, the back, the back shows you the economic engine that we are, of course, you know, 4,000 plus employees with a 300 million payroll. Um, we brought in over a quarter billion dollars of research funds this past year for the first time ever. And the, the importance of a quarter billion dollars coming into Vermont, and, and thanks to Senator Leahy, of course, mm -hmm. part of it, but is that this money is spent here in Vermont. Mm -hmm. It's spent on research that matters to Vermont, you know, addiction and opioids and, and uh, small-scale food systems and sustainable farming and um, rural partnerships, you know, Gun Institute for Environment and um, agroecology and all these kinds of things, cancer. So I think the kind of work that's done is very important to the lives and livelihoods of uh, Vermonters, but we also hire a lot of and attract a lot of high-end technical staff and, and lab staff and all that. So that's a big plus. And we had a study done uh, well, six years ago. I know I'm sure that number is much higher now, but we, we have seen a $1.3 billion impact. I wouldn't be surprised if it's twice as much today. So clearly we have a very big economic impact in the state, plus our alumni, we've got almost 36,000 alumni in the state. And that number is also a little old. We need to keep updating it. But, um, but I think, I think- um, Two members of Senate education. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I think we all care about some aspects more. Vermont struggling with housing, with childcare, with 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 people, you know, talent and such. So I just wanted to also put in that last set of bullets below, which is, you know, 33 percent, a third of the physicians in Vermont are trained at, at UVM, and if you look at just primary care physicians, it's 41 percent. So I'm very proud of that. We keep working on increasing that. Mm -hmm. um, 80 percent of students in licensure programs are just teachers. Uh, um, live in and work in Vermont after graduating from uh, yeah. UVM. And 80% of our graduate students and 50% of the undergrads in the nursing and health sciences programs stay. So these are all critical areas, nurses, teachers, doctors, 
And so we're doing the best we can. Um, we'll continue to grow this thing. I know Senator Sanders, for example, has been very focused on the nursing side of things and has put some programs in and helped us with some clinical placements in community health centers and stuff. So, so in that way too, we, uh, I think we're doing the best we can. And I, I just end with saying that we're a very good bet. I mean, the investment of the state in the UVM is rather, you know, it's quite small compared to national standards per capita, um, 49th or 50th, but I understand if we don't have a big tax base. I appreciate the help we got last year, but um, to last year, so we, we always had a half of our money, of the money that came from the state went to scholarships. A quarter went to the College of Medicine and a quarter went to Extension Agriculture. So, and then the new money that came in last year all goes to sort of helping student aid. So um, with that, I guess the ask that I hope you'll all consider endorsing is that we as we worked with the governor, we talked to him about a 3% increase in our base, like um, he's providing to other, or he's put in for other state agencies and such. It's a kind of cost of living increase. So a 3% increase in base, and then there's a $3 million um, one-time ask for three years. It's a million a year for three years for the upskill program. Some of you have been in the legislature know the Upskill Vermont program. It was an extremely successful program. We've done it twice. Um, this is a program by which the state sends us money and we use it all to support um, Vermonters taking classes um, online by and large. And so both last year and the year before that, the moment we announced the classes, all of them were signed up for within 24 hours or so. And so there's a great demand. If you could do three times as much, I think we would have uh, we would that would be absorbed. And we've actually tuned our offerings to what we're seeing the demand for healthcare, um, you know, program management, project management kind of thing, um, leadership, et, et cetera. So I think if we do it for a three year period, I think there's a little more planning that people can do and we can do. So it's a pass through. I mean, we, we spend it on educating Vermonters to, you know, once they dip their toes in taking another class or so, then they maybe take another and another, maybe do a certificate and an advanced degree and train themselves, et cetera. So the two asks we have for the legislature this year are the 3% increase in our base and the 3 million one time and upskill. The governor is thankfully put them both in his budget, so we'll <coughs> for endorsement from you. I'm happy to answer questions, many from to, you know, housing, whatever else, I haven't covered everything right now. Senator Dewar. I have an easy question and then okay. a uh -huh. really hard one. Um, the first one is the percentage of Vermont students in the total student body. <coughs> is that historically about the same percentage that we've had, let's say, over the last uh, 30, 20, 30 years? Do you know? Or So the number of Vermont students, um, <laughs> you know, it's a tricky question. It's actually not an easy question because okay. the number of high school students is dropping, right? right. So. You know, again, if there were 7,200 students uh, graduating in 2010, let's say half of them applied, right. um, you know, there were more uh, mm -hmm. that could get in. So the way I see it is about 5,000 students graduate, give or take. Mm -hmm. About 3,000 want to go on to college. About 2,000 apply to UVM, and about 1,700 get in. So it's really a very good bet. If you've got reasonable grades, you get it. Um, some others want to go to Harvard and whatever else, you know, more power to them, it's okay. Uh, so we're a very good bet for Vermonters. As, I mean, depending on whenever your ba the baseline is, you know, once upon a time we were a much smaller school. Yeah. So our, our number of students has grown. Um, not in the last few years though, because we have committed to about 3,000 students per year. We talked about this, I think. So our new students per year is about 3,000. It's not an exact science, so sometimes it drops a little bit below, sometimes it goes above, but um, we're not, we don't have a plan to increase the number of undergrad students uh, coming in every year. Um, we do think the graduate programs could, could benefit from growing a little bit, especially with our research funding growing a lot. And so and we will continue to house the first and second year students on campus. We're working on housing options. Um, that was my second question. Good. So. That's the easy one. The first one was actually the hard one. So we're really committed to being a part of the solution in housing. So um, you know that Vermont has a challenge with housing. Chittenden County has an even greater challenge. Burlington has an even greater challenge. And so um, we continue to house all our first and second years on campus. But 
it's not only them, right? It's our grad students, it's our staff. We've had five or six staff last year take jobs at UVM and turn us down after when mm -hmm. they couldn't find housing. Yeah, so, yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. Different spots. so we're building, um, ground is being broken, I think, next week to build about 600 new beds in South Burlington, about a mile, 1.2 miles from campus. So yeah, these are apartments that are good for staff, for faculty, especially early in career, their careers, graduate students. Um, uh, we were going to have about 490 beds originally was the plan. And you know they were gonna come in tranches of in 2024, 25 and 26. We worked with the developer to increase that number by about 100 beds and finish the project by 2025, one year in advance. So we will have 600 almost new beds um, on the market, if you will, um, if, in, a, in a couple of years. And then we're looking at a number of other options. Um, I'm hoping that if you're successful in all these things we're trying to do, we'll have about 1,500 new beds by the next year or so, year and a half. I mean, in terms of our line of sight to them. And all, so, does, all devoted to UVM, students, These, these are things we would, that we okay. would uh, gotcha. provide, which is therefore Great. for us. You know, there are different tranches. Undergrads need a different approach than graduate students, faculty and staff. Even within undergrads, there's first and second year students on campus, there's third and fourth year students who don't want to stay on campus. Right. And so what can we do for them, et cetera. So we're looking at different creative options in each of those areas. And mm -hmm. we'll continue to be, I'm hoping, announce some more uh, success with each of those things. But I hope that the city and the county and the state also um, look at this issue and try to yeah. uh, really fast. It, you know. so. Huge issue everywhere. <laughs> right now. Yeah. So my, just back to your admissions, 30,000 applications, that's yeah. incredible. Yes. So who are the kids that are getting it? If you could just give us a little profile. When you said pretty good grades and you're gonna go to UVM if you're from Vermont, that's a lot of, that's a, you, it's very competitive without a doubt, you can, it seems yes. to me. So there's two pieces to your question. Vermont students yeah. have a leg up. Great. And they get it. Great. Okay. You can be a reasonable student in Vermont and get it. Right. I don't have a number. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. yeah. For sure. Yeah. And we provide, you know, on average, we, we get very little tuition from Vermont students. But yeah. Again, half of them attend, pay no tuition at all, pretty much. Great. And yeah. 90, 90 yeah. to 92 percent get story. Yeah. lots of uh, A. So for Vermonters, it's a very different story. Mm -hmm. As I said, you know, if, if these numbers aren't exact, so I'm, I'm a little worried about just throwing them out there. But about 2,000 students apply, about 1,700 or so are offered admission, or whether they take it or not, it's a different question. On the other hand, our incoming class is the best prepared class ever in terms of GPA, SAT scores, ACT scores, et cetera. So if you're mm -hmm. outside Vermont, um, it's actually pretty darn difficult to get in these mm -hmm. days, which is interesting because, you know, people were saying, there were people who told me, you know, Vermont's become a, a sort of a safety school or something, you know, we're under, and then their children apply, I'm not hearing and that. They, their children apply, they don't get in, and they say, hmm. <laughs> so um, it's not, it's become harder and harder because there, there's a lot of interest. Mm -hmm. um, and I think part of it is the affordability thing, right? The fact that we care about this, the fact that we did really, really well in COVID, yeah. Um, we didn't have a single student hospitalized through our COVID. We say, hey, right? I, you know, that message gets up, and uh, it's not all my doing. It's the students were very, very careful. Um, everyone was vaccinated. Every one of our employees was vaccinated. Faculty, staff, etc. They masked when they were supposed to mask. If they behaved themselves, and nobody went to hospital. None of the students. So, um, so that word gets out, I think, and so we're getting a lot of interest in our research. The fact that we are really good at sustainability work and environment and food systems and complex systems and you know cancer care, liberal arts, all of that. School of the Arts, we started a new school, School of the Arts, a new, just announced new school of world languages and cultures. These kinds of things um, sort of raise the profile and draw more interest and attention, rightly so. Since we have time, right? We can yeah, yeah. 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 Um, <clears throat> We have you until seven, <laughs> <laughs> but then we're definitely late. Yeah, pizza, right? Good stuff. Okay. Um, the UVM Promise, yeah, which is fabulous. Mm -hmm. It reminded me of a conversation that we had yesterday about how Vermont is this fabulous place, but how do we get the word? Like, how do you get the word out there? How do you tell the story? And so I'm wondering if you 
you, I'm assuming you have a designated sort of social media advertising department that is working on that. Um, that was one of my questions. And the other one is, you know, using an equity lens, um, are you, do you go into neighborhoods or, you know, again, parts of Burlington and Winooski with um, literature and information that is already translated for those folks so that, because it's great for the kids to have the information, but if the parents have the information, then it's even more powerful. Yeah. Um, so, um, Sorry, I'll talk about the engagement with schools. The first part was? The first part was the advertising. Social right. Media. So, yes, we have, I think, what, the number five ranked Instagram account or something, I'm told by my people. So, yes, I mean, we're working hard at it. Wendy, can you send, um, send the, uh, mm -hmm. or everyone here, the um, yes. uh, campus video? Uh, yeah. So, we had 10 students record their stories, two, two minute clips. Um, it is so wonderful to see. Okay, this is uh, students of color, women, men, different disciplines. They just said why they came to UVM and how much they enjoy it. This is such an uplifting thing, and it's all over, all the administrators are getting it. So, um, you know, it's never enough, and, um, I'm, I'm not on TikTok. I'm not going to get on TikTok, but <laughs> and, um, <laughs> but we um, we work hard at that. And clearly, if thirty thousand students are applying, they're getting the work right. Mm -hmm. The equity lens is very important. So this is where I, I mentioned Carol Odi is very mm -hmm. um, you know is working with um, Katie Shepard and others in engaging with the Winooski schools, the Burlington High Schools, etc. We have a program, we've had a long standing, I had nothing to do with it, this was set up well before I came, um, where we, we, we have give a full ride to a bunch of students in the Bronx, um, African American students, who come here and thrive and do really well. Um, it's an expensive program, but you know, it's there. And so we do think a lot about how to engage. It's hard to attract students of color to Vermont, mm -hmm. or, or staff of color to Vermont. Um, they don't see themselves in the surroundings. But we're far browner than the state of Vermont. And uh, um, and as I said, we had the largest number of students of color this fall uh, and than ever before. A third of our faculty this past year, full-time faculty, were hired last year and the year before identified as, student, as faculty of color. So I think it comes in all, all levels. We need administrators who yeah, yes, look different. You need yeah. faculty who look different. You need staff. Yeah. So it's not easy, um, but we're very focused on that. We have a very data-driven approach now, a new approach to diversity, equity, inclusion, mm -hmm. not only recruitment, but how to take care of them on their own campus. There's a strategic plan. There's a university-wide university diversity council mm -hmm. that has one empowered representative from every unit mm -hmm. um, so that it's there's accountability that goes uh, to all levels. So. In, in Burlington and Winooski as well, we have um, staff called multilingual liaisons who work really closely with families, and it would be great to yeah. somehow, um, I don't know, engage them to help with this mission. Right. I think it's, the translation piece, I don't know. Yeah. I'm sure that they can reach out to our admissions people and get that. I know we do a lot of translation services for our custodial staff. Okay. Um, there's a lot of them, and many speak Eastern European languages or, or Nepali or whatever else. Um, so we do do that. Uh, I don't know how much of a demand we have for, um, clearly the students can go explain to their parents and they know English, but mm -hmm. we will look into that to see if there's a, you know, that's a productive thing to do and we'll also talk to the schools to see if they'd like uh, things translated. Yes. And the kind of thing is that, you say the cultural liaisons? Mm -hmm. Multilingual because we did something in this committee we can go back and look at with cultural liaisons and community and communities two years ago I mean that might be another okay I we got totally yeah, yeah. Totally. yeah. yeah. questions this guy would like to get a, another degree at UVM maybe <laughs> very good <laughs> I'll give you a, a JD right. my older sons are warm. oh wonderful oh, that's oh, great. is he happy is he doing well he's not working in his career field who is? Right. <laughs> My degree is in political yeah. science. Okay, yep. all right. So I'm out there. I'm a mechanical engineer, and I've been a mechanical engineer all my life. I've been doing a few other things. So. <laughs>
This has been terrific. Always good to see Thank you. you. Thank we you. appreciate it. I know it's a, few, uh, a couple of us were on campus this mm -hmm. right, earlier. Please, you're we, welcome <clears> to <throat> come. Thank you. We do this. You know, it's easy to host a you know, vegan chili on a hot on a, on a cold day. Yeah, we yeah. You know, uh, just have a chat and, and uh, you know, so that's for me. The so, food was amazing. Um, it was great. Yeah. So thank you for having us. Thank you. Always. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Wendy, great to see you. Have have a good good weekend. Weekend. See you. See you. Take care. Thanks, Tony. Yeah. Thank <laughs> Great to see you. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Nice to see Thank you. you. Okay. See you soon. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we do have the, our last witness. We'll only take 15 minutes. If we're comfortable, we'll just go into 315. That gives us a little 15 minute break. Sure. Um, okay. Yeah. Are we starting?